Good evening. All right, we're working. It's my honor and my pleasure to introduce Benjamin Holton, the Ronald P. Lynch Dean of the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences and Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell University. Dean Holton came to Cornell in 2020 from the University of California at Davis, where he was a faculty member in environmental studies, the director of the John Muir Institute of the Environment, and a leader in working with California tribes to bring indigenous knowledge to bear on the challenges of agricultural and environmental sustainability. Dean Holton's research in global eco ecosystem processes in agricultural sustainability has been published in Nature, Science, and other leading academic journals. He also currently directs more than 100 acres of farmland carbon sequestration projects intended to improve crop yields and create new financial markets for farmers and ranchers. On a personal note, Dean Holton and I are both natives of the Upper Midwest with farming in our family heritage. He was one of the first deans I officially met with when I arrived at Cornell this past spring and his account of what his college is doing to address climate change and food insecurity was absolutely electrifying. And that was before the floods, fires, and heat waves of this summer came along to underscore how urgent these challenges are. If you follow Cornell history, you'll know that Cornell is famous for its part in driving missions to Mars. From Carl Sagan's planning for the Viking missions in the 1970s, to the Mars rovers of today. Tonight, Dean Holton will tell us about Cornell's mission to Earth, agriculture as a holistic solution. Please join me in welcoming Ben Holton. Well, it's terrific to be here. You know, thank you for coming out with this incredible storm. Uh, that just hit us. It's like the 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 the, the sky just opened, <laughs> and uh, I have wet feet right now. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't uh, cause me to be unable to deliver a good lecture for you. Um, I also want to thank Dean uh, Leffelholtz for this opportunity to address you tonight, and for you t for taking the time to come out and uh, get a chance to talk to hear a little bit about the college and what we're doing. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention this auditorium named after a former dean of Cal's, uh, Dave Call. And uh, you know, it's exciting to be thinking about agriculture in this time of extremes. And that was one of the themes that I wanted to hit on, but I had no idea the backdrop would be so uh, apropos <laughs> to what I was going to be discussing. But we know that it's been an incredibly amazing year. It's been the warmest year. Um, in our modern record on the planet. Uh, the ocean temperature is greatly exceeding any surface ocean te temperature that's ever been observed. And we're seeing evidence of growing extreme conditions in the form of droughts, heat waves, and wildfires. And so we have entered a new era. Uh, like I say, climate change has fully entered our living rooms. And it's clear that we need to catalyze holistic solutions to this grand challenge. Not only that, we need to think about meeting the needs of a growing world population with nutritious food, with just access. And these are incredible issues of our time. So I'm gonna be talking today about that. And I would like to start with what I hope is you find to be my main point, that agriculture is perhaps the most important industry of the 21st century that there is no more important aspect of human society than continuing to grow healthy food and to drive us forward for a healthy planet. And that's kind of a fundamental new twist that I'll get into today, wherein agriculture is not only producing uh, large amounts of food uh, for many people, for diversified interests, but also becoming a valuable weapon in the battle against climate change and helping to secure a more uh, prosperous future in terms of natural ecosystems. So when I get into the issues tonight, I won't promise the ability to touch on every aspect of the agri-food system. I mean, we have professors who spend lectures after lectures after year after year getting into all the nuts and bolts that goes in to growing food, 
getting it to our dinner plates, the supply chains involved, the people involved. There is really no more complex system than the food system when you think of the diversity of cultures, beliefs, policies, industry, startup, technology, innovation, growing practices around the world. But what I will do instead is get into what I see as three critical verticals that are revolutionizing the food system today and will continue to have far-reaching widespread impact in the decades ahead. These are issues that, and technologies that are going to be part of our daily lives. And I want to talk about not only what these issues look like today, but what they may look like in the future as the college continues to also seek out new pathways to make critical investments to drive our agri-food system forward, one that not only feeds people but nourishes the planet. So in this context, I will start with a brief history of agriculture, and it's going to be a, a short snapshot. But it's quite astonishing when you look at what's happened over the past 100 years in the food system. Then I'm going to talk about the three areas, digital agriculture, lab-based technologies, and indoor controlled environment agriculture, how these are emerging as positive disruptions on the food system and the way in which we are going to be growing food uh, into the future. And then I'll end with Cornell's role in this food system transformation, uh, where we are placing incredible bets where we think the food system's going, and our scientists, our students, our staff, and our mission, a global land grant to the world, is coming together to help uh, the world find pathways for new solutions to climate, biodiversity, environment, and a healthy, uh, supportive food system. So when I was thinking about this today, I was trying to figure out how I can start a talk <laughs> that has such a grand ambition. I thought, why not just bring it back home? So on the photo uh, that's in front of you, on, the, uh, on your, I guess it would be left-hand side, uh, is my grandfather. That's Jerry Holton. And he's there with his brother, Jack. Jerry and Jack were farmers, dairy farmers, uh, in the Midwest. They spent a lot of their time in Missouri, Ohio, Kansas, and Wisconsin. I like to say, when you shake my family tree, dairy farmers fall out of every branch. And so while all these farms and this farming history in my family is critical to who I am, I didn't grow up on a farm. By the time I was born, the last farm in Wisconsin was sold off, and we have one remaining farm in Kansas that has about 400 uh, dairy cows that my great aunt and uncle still operate. But I was thinking about this photo and thinking about the time in which they were farming in the United States. That would have been somewhere between the 1940s all the way to the 1970s and 80s. Um, so a pretty broad uh, arena of decades. But really, their focus starting uh, in earnest in the 1950s and 60s. My grandfather had an eighth grade education. Uh, so, you know, he taught himself how to breed cows. And, you know, I had to show a picture of uh, this uh, cow right here, which is Mooseheart Pioneer. And this wasn't my grandfather's cow, but he was able to take Mooseheart Pioneer and breed an award winning cow uh, that produced incredible. Uh, incredible amount of milk in Ohio that was called Moose Heart Sensation. So with an eighth grade education, he tinkered, he explored, and he was able to produce a really fine animal that was able to produce a lot of dairy. Now, unbeknownst to him, and unbeknownst to my uncle, they were in the midst of a radical transformation in the United States. And so what I've shown here is the percent of American workforce that was engaged in agriculture from 1840 to year 2000. We start here with the founding of Cornell in 1865, and you can see that at that time, uh, approximately, I'm trying to figure out how to work this, there we go, right here, uh, anywhere between 70 to 50% or so of the United States workforce was engaged in agriculture. That means that more than one out of two every people you ran into was growing food in the country. And it was for survival, it was for subsistence, but it was also starting to form 
the foundation for a prosperous economy. Now we go to Cal's founding. At that time, the New York State uh, College of Agriculture, as it was called, now the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and Liberty Hyde Bailey as the first dean in 1905. And we can see that by that time, it was approximately 50% or slightly less, uh, so one out of every two people, a little bit less. Then we get to the time in which my uh, grandfather and my uncle, my great uncle, were spending their time uh, uh, engaged in agriculture in the Midwest. And we can see that by then, now we dip down to about 10%. That means one out of every 10 of us is engaged in agriculture to today where the number is around 4%. This is a radical transformation in the United States that oftentimes isn't discussed, but it's amazing to think about the way in which the foundation of our country, based in food, has now transformed to one where very few people are making food. And what's even more interesting is to think about the population during that time period. Now, at first glance, you might say, well, there's no way the human population could have expanded while we're losing all these farmers we're producing with fewer and fewer people. But in fact, the United States population has exploded in that amount of time. And the projections are that we will continue to see an increase in the population of the United States through 2050. So the food system has clearly changed from one in which most people were engaged in growing food to one in which very few people are engaged in growing food and yet more and more people are being fed than ever before. How is that possible? Well, of course, we have to highlight what's called the Green Revolution. This is the first great industrial revolution in agriculture, which was led uh, by uh, Norman Borlaug, or at least he's credited with uh, being the father of the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution is a time where biotechnology, irrigation and infrastructure, pesticides, and fertilizers come together to give rise to an incredibly efficient food system. One that is highly input driven, one that moves toward more and more precision agriculture, but one in which we see an incredible increase in the amount of food that's grown. So on the top, Here, we have cereal gains over time. In the, in the blue, we have nitrogen fertilizer, water, and phosphorus fertilizer in green, and then we have pesticide growth. This is in the United States, including both imports and use. And so it's quite clear that while we saw these radical gains and have continued to see incredible gains in cereal production, this has been driven by a certain approach based on what is called the Green Revolution. And this green revolution on a worldwide scale has radically transformed the food system. So not only have these changes occurred in the United States, but we've seen changes such as these occur worldwide. These are uh, values that are weighted according to 1961. So those values would be zero. And this is the change that we've seen. In the red, we have total cereal production. So that includes the land and the yield gains uh, associated with the production of cereals. In the green, we have the yield increases. And in the uh, purple, we have human population growth. So what you can see is that these changes in yield and total production have outstripped population growth uh, by uh, a pretty significant margin. And yet, what I'd like to highlight is here on the bottom where you can see land use used for cereal. And while we saw these massive increases and have continued to see increases in yield and production and population growth, the total amount of land only increased by 16% in terms of its total use. And estimates suggest without the Green Revolution, we would need three times the amount of land to grow food today. So this is an incredible feat of humanity 
to think about the fact that we transition from an agricultural system that was based on most people growing the food to, uh, relatively inefficiently to one that has incredible gains in efficiency, to one that has actually conserved land relative to the land that would be used if we had not developed these innovative technologies. And this is a major reason why Norman Borlaug received the Nobel Peace Prize for feeding hungry around the world through his innovations. And yet, I'm going to argue that this is essential, but not sufficient to the 21st century. And while we can highlight and celebrate these gains, and we really should celebrate them because they show the innovative spirit of people coming together, of university research, of extension, of private sector engagement, of industry, of communities, all coming together to create this incredible food system and drive efficiencies, we know that there have been many challenges and unwanted consequences that have come with the Green Revolution. For example, 50% of Earth's land surface is used to grow food today. So while we can look at the data and say it's amazing that we would need more land to grow food if we hadn't innovated these technologies, we still know that this is the major land use on the planet. And that has threatened biodiversity and led to the loss of habitat worldwide. We also know that freshwater resources continue to diminish on the planet not only through utilization, but also through the impacts of climate change. The food system, uh, to this end, has contributed around 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is giving rise to uh, global climate change around the world. And fertilizer runoff has impaired water quality uh, in the Great Lakes, locally, as well as worldwide. So the Green Revolution has brought us a bounty of food but it has not necessarily solved some of these challenges with water, fertilizer, land use uh, coming together. And some scientists have argued that we've hit the point at which we've exceeded Earth's planetary boundaries of safe operation. Now, I don't fully subscribe to some of these perspectives, but I think it is worth looking at the data that have been compiled by these groups of scientists to show that this is the safe operating space. And when it comes to water use by plants, if you go outside the safe operating space uh, as you proceed outward from the centroid, you can see that they consider us to be on a non-sustainable path. Also, Earth's biodiversity shown up here in terms of genetic diversity has been greatly diminished on the planet. Novel entities such as chemicals, some of which come from agriculture, but many come from uh, all forms of industry, as well as genetic modifications, have altered uh, the environments in which we are currently living on the planet. And nitrogen and phosphorus continue to spill over in rates that are not sustainable and that are causing incredible challenge. Moreover, we are beginning to see that the influence of climate change and rising greenhouse gases is affecting our food system. Uh, this is in the form of extreme events, oftentimes heat waves, droughts, wildfires that cause yields to go down. You can have events like derachos that can hit uh, Iowa and wipe out their entire uh, corn crop, which happened a few years ago. We could go on and on. A scientist at Cornell University in uh, the Dyson School, as well as the Department of Global Development in CALS, recently estimated that we've already lost a fifth of our global food yields to climate impacts. And if we project these data out to 2050, uh, many estimates suggest that we will be losing more than 50% of the world's food production to these incredible climate impacts that we're seeing. Moreover, while we were seeing incredible gains in uh, improving the number of people who are hungry on the planet we are starting to see that some of those gains have been erased. This is the number of people who are hungry, and they're starting to come back up again. Now, part of this has been precipitated by the pandemic and the way in which it influenced global food availability, and uh, we're all quite familiar with that. But it's also evidence 
of a growing extreme condition on, of climate on food uh, availability on the planet. So I would submit to you that we're really at a time where we have to think differently about the food system. That the green revolution technologies are gonna be critical to our future. That production agriculture will still be a big part of the way we grow food on the planet. But we also have to start operating within a different set of conditions where we think about our food system not only as providing nutrition and reducing hunger, but also a healthy planet moving forward. I believe this should be based on three different pillars. One, a nutritionally equitable food system. As we saw from those data, 800 uh, uh, million people worldwide are waking up every day hungry. And in terms of hidden hunger, which is access to micronutrients, those numbers are closer to 2 billion people. As the Earth's human population moves past 8 billion to 9 billion and 10 billion by 2050, it is gonna be even more difficult to continue to make sure that everyone has access to healthy, nutritious food. Moreover, we need a food system that's resilient, one that's not only resilient to weather extremes, but that's resilient to other kinds of shocks, like the Ukraine war, and other things that will continue to happen as we face resource scarcities moving forward. And we need one that is climate smart. And now by climate smart, I don't only mean that it's capable of withstanding extreme events, I mean a food system that is absorbing CO2 from the air, bringing new sources of revenue to farmers in the form of carbon dioxide removal. That in a nutshell is the kind of food system we need to move toward in order to ensure a sustainable world uh, for us and for our children. Within this idea, I wanna focus now on three verticals that are imparting major disruption on our food system. These are happening, they've been happening in some cases for over a decade, but they're still coming into focus and they're gonna be key levers on the future of food. Each of them offer opportunities for sustainability, for new ways of creating food access, and inviting resilience. And yet, all these technologies, all these ideas still are in their infancy and need a huge amount of research, development, and understanding, not only from a scientific perspective, but also from a consumer perspective, from a supply chain perspective, and a sustainability perspective. The three pillars that I wanna talk about in order are digital agriculture, the next will be indoor agriculture, and the third will be lab-based technologies to grow food. Digital agriculture is transforming the way in which we're growing food today. We can think of digital agriculture as tools or techniques that impart rapid generation and utilization of data in real time to make decisions with sensors, robotics, computer algorithms, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. This is a huge part of the transformation that is starting to happen in our food system. It's becoming more uh, automized, it's becoming more digital, and it's pressing because we are seeing labor shortages uh, in terms of food production uh, right here in New York and around the United States and globally. So we need these technologies to start making smart decisions with more precision agriculture and sustainability in mind. Right here at Cornell, we are leading several efforts, but the most significant one runs through the Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture. Now, we hear of Cornell as a place that has low fences to collaboration, and I think that's quite a good analogy. But in this case, it's really unique because we have world-leading uh, Bowers College of Computer and Information Science, incredible expertise in the College of Engineering, we have a school of vet med, and of course we have the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences coming together to think about the future of food and how digital technologies, robotics, AI, machine learning, new genomic approaches can change the way in which we grow food so it's more efficient, it's climate smart, it's resilient, and it's capable of improving the environmental conditions around us. 
One example of this would be the recent Cornell Agricultural Systems Testbed and demonstration site, which is called the Farm of the Future. The Farm of the Future was uh, just granted to uh, Cornell University, led by a professor in animal science, Julio Giordana, who also is a member of the Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture. This grant is a demonstration of how technologies can be infused throughout the full supply chain of food production in demonstration scale using robotics, sensors, satellite imagery, drones to ascertain the power of data and use those data to make smart decisions about growing conditions, about productivity, uh, and in this case, focusing on dairy and creating circular systems uh, in dairy management. This grant has a cluster of three farms in New York that are gonna be working in collaboration with the team that will then be engaging in data-driven data decisions and leverage our extension networks. CAST, as it's called, will focus on field crops and dairy production as model of the US agricultural economy. And it will leverage the integrated data tools to improve efficiencies, reduce agriculture's environmental impacts, and examine the social, social economic, and farm level financial impacts of the implementation of these technologies. The next case I wanna talk about here is controlled environment agriculture, also known as indoor agriculture, uh, to give it a simple term. And this one is having a radical effect. Now, it's a close cousin of digital agriculture because controlled environment agriculture is different than the classic greenhouse agriculture. In fact, this is done at warehouse scale in many cases and oftentimes hydroponically, but as I'll talk about, it can be uh, performed in many different ways. In controlled environment agriculture, you take advantage of the lighting systems, the energy environment, the plant growing conditions to optimize to uh, produce food over a longer photo period and throughout the entire year in climates where you can't do that. Some of the benefits of controlled environment ag include a more resilient cropping system that can withstand extreme events, one that can lower the carbon footprint of transportation if it's done locally and integrated into the food system, one that can create very diagnostic nutritious food at a precision level, and one that can grow jobs in a new economy based in more technology-driven uh, sectors. This uh, advancement in controlled environment agriculture has really been taking off for the past several years. Now in New York State, this is the fastest growing sector of the agricultural economy today. And it's starting to power a new kind of workforce that is much more tech-driven uh, than previous agricultural systems. It's not a perfect solution. There are many challenges. Some of you may have read about uh, the companies that have been producing and yet finding struggles. There was a lot of capital investment that came in. In fact, estimates suggest about an 18.7% or close to 19% compound annual growth rate with uh, controlled environment ag uh, in the world. And in Europe, we're seeing incredible market penetration where the vast majority of the uh, work has taken place, now about 30% of the total market share in Europe. In areas such as the Netherlands, the entire economy is trying to uh, create controlled environment agriculture to support its future food system. There are many issues. Some of the issues include the fragmented nature in which the controlled environment systems are developing, uh, lack of capital, lack of economic margins and profits that can be gained, but there's so much promise in this kind of technology. Recently, I was in Singapore where I learned that the country is, which is an island state, is trying to become 30% food self-sufficient by 2030. The way in which they're doing that is by making significant investments in vertical agriculture, controlled environment agriculture, in other technologies. So I do think that this is going to be a radical transformation to our food system that is unlikely to be supporting field level crops, but very much aligned with uh, lettuce and tomatoes and um, uh, herbs and things like that that you, can, uh, that you can get from your grocery store. 
Data suggests that there has been incredible growth in the economics uh, and the value add of controlled environment agriculture going back to 2022 here based on assessments. You can see that it was about $74 billion as an industry and it's estimated to transform by 2032 to about $377 billion. So it is exploding. It's taking place in hydroponics, aeroponics, uh, in uh, soil-based approaches, but especially in the hydroponic arena. The third vertical I wanna talk about has to do with lab-based technologies. So there's many forms in which lab-grown food is transforming the food system today. You're probably familiar with the impossible foods uh, and the way in which that is tied to plant-based products using hemoglobin from soy and transforming that into a substance that starts to approximate something that tastes more like meat. But when we talk about some of the most disruptive technologies, we're focused on lab-based synthesis, taking proteins, biomolecules, substrates, and cells from animals and growing them in a lab to create meat that is, by all accounts, identical to the meat that you might get uh, from an animal. And yet, it's grown in a lab. So this is an incredible disruption that is now just starting to take off. I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what we call synthetic biology, or the way in which we can uh, create food from proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, trace elements, cells, and even the air. This is an estimate of the way in which alternative proteins, which are becoming more and more uh, dominated by lab-based technologies, are likely to affect the protein demands of people in the future. There's a couple things I wanna point out here. In the yellow light, light color, we have alternative proteins, uh, progressively from synthetic pathways using synthetic biology in the lab. Here what we, in the middle, we have what are called uh, addressable conventional proteins. These are proteins that can be supplemented at some point through lab-based technologies, but we're really far off from that. And in the bottom are protein forms that are unlikely to be synthesized in the lab. So the first thing we can see here is that even with growth in the amount of lab-based technologies that could provide protein, animal source foods are gonna to continue to grow on the planet. And that's based on the total protein demands going up and the way in which conventional proteins continue to be the major part of the human diet. I don't vote, view these as uh, opposing to each other, rather I think these technologies, uh, a lab-based technology versus a traditional conventional uh, grown food from animals are quite complementary and are probably gonna find very different niches and consumers out there. But it is interesting to think about the fact that we are approaching a time where we know we can grow food that is identical in terms of meat uh, in the lab as, as it is in the animals without actually having to raise an animal, feed an animal, and engage in that full supply chain. And in fact, maybe you read just a few weeks ago, the uh, USDA has now uh, empowered two companies that are making chicken from a lab that you can buy. Uh, maybe some of you have had it yet, I have not. Uh, but you can buy in certain restaurants. I understand that in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, it's available. It's really expensive right now. It's not something you would imagine you'd pick up at the grocery store anytime soon. And there's a lot of questions about the supply chains involved. In fact, a recent study suggested that lab-based uh, meat has a bigger carbon footprint than what we see in animal systems at this point, and that's because the supply chains are not refined, and if it's connected to fossil fuel combustion, uh, it's going to have a bigger carbon footprint. So there is so much work to do, not only in the technology itself, in optimizing the way the cells are grown, the substrates that are used, but also the full supply chain that gives uh, rise to this kind of uh, food of the future. But it is certainly revolutionary, and you are in your lifetimes and in, in your future, your kids' lifetime, there is going to be 
uh, I would be willing to bet a considerable amount of lab-based meat that's available for consumption by consumers. Moreover, I put this up just as kind of a vignette, but when we think of synthetic biology in the college, which I'll talk about in a bit, we think much more broadly. This is a recent visit we had by the Lieutenant Governor uh, Delgado, and he was really curious to learn more about how our scientists are leveraging the power of synthetic biology, not just for food production, but for many different uses. This is a lab, uh, Buzz, Buzz Barstow, he's a professor in biological and environmental engineering, and he's figuring out, using these genetic approaches and these trait appropriation approaches, how to get microbes to mine minerals without the acids that can be very harmful for the environment. And even take demolished material and have these microbes go into it and use their own uh, sort of acidifying systems to extract metals and then take those metals and turn them into an iPhone or into a solar panel. So synthetic biology is something that is incredibly disruptive overall, but we're definitely gonna to continue to see it uh, play a big role in our food system. So I've given you kind of a snapshot for some of the major areas we're starting to see changes. I don't think we've seen a revolution like this in the food system or in the agricultural system since the Green Revolution back in the 50s and 60s. It's quite different than that revolution, but it's gonna have an incredibly transformative impact on the food we have access to and on the sustainability of the planet moving forward. How do we build on this momentum? Well, now I'm gonna talk about how we're taking these verticals and we're infusing them horizontally using our collaborative approach and our transdisciplinary knowledge in the College of Agricultural Life Sciences, as well as our connectivity to Cornell in our extension systems. The way we're thinking about this is by taking a long range view. Uh, a couple of years ago, we engaged in a new visioning process we call our Roadmap to 2050. Now, in most cases, you might take a five or 10 year view when you think about where you wanna make investments. But at this time, where there's so much change happening in AI, machine learning, biotechnology, genomics, uh, synthetic biology, controlled environment ag, and sustainability and climate, we knew that we had to think bigger. We had to think more long range. So with this roadmap to 2050, we uh, asked our experts where they saw the future. And we also engaged in external audiences. And through that activity, we were able to prototype a few ideas where we wanted to focus on making some major investments uh, in the future of the college. Our overarching vision fell into several areas. One, leading in what we call the solution century. It's hard to be optimistic sometimes when you're seeing all the changes that are happening. But the college believes strongly and is deeply committed to leading with informed optimism and driving solutions forward to make the world a better place than we found it. In addition, we understand our legacy of local to global and back again. As the home base sort of land grant for New York State, we are deeply committed to making sure the state is prosperous and vibrant and innovative and always driving forward. We also know that our food system and these issues we face are globally connected. We saw that during the pandemic and we definitely see it today with many of the issues that we're facing such as climate change. So the models we wanna perfect in the college are those that think locally, go globally, and then come right back home to think about the full ensemble of opportunities in front of us. A third area is to build upon our core strengths. Now it would be a mistake not to look at this incredible legacy of the institution and figure out how you can continue to advance that legacy by looking at our strengths in environmental, social, agricultural, and life sciences. So we thought deeply about making sure that we don't lose our disciplinary knowledge as we take on uh, new opportunities on the edges of where the college is at. And then finally, making sure that we're always pursuing collaborative, transdisciplinary scholarship. Now, collaborative means that we're working together 
It doesn't mean we always agree, but it means that we're working together, we're taking disciplines, and they're finding new opportunities to innovate, drive solutions, and take on uh, valuable research. And we also know that's the way in which we are training the students of today for tomorrow. Transdisciplinary means that when we come together, we are poised to translate our results to the outside world. So rather than focusing inward, we think outside in and inside out. And we make sure that we have the right partners connected to our programs so that our questions are relevant to the challenges that they're facing today. So while we focus on a roadmap to 2050, we get very practical with what we need to do to make sure that the land grant mission still continues to function to benefit the state of New York. With this vision, one of the ideas that we recognized is that some of the greatest innovations that have ever happened have occurred when researchers go outside their comfort zones. When they're put in an environment where they engage in team-based science, working across disciplines. And this holds true when you look at Nobel Prize winners and you ask the question, is there a common uh, commonality to those that have won Nobel Prizes? Not that we're trying to recruit people and say, win a Nobel. But what is the environmental condition? The environmental condition is that they dared to work with colleagues who spoke a different language, an economist, a lawyer, a physiologist. Maybe they were a computer scientist. That's where the innovation happens. So through that, we wanted to make sure that we were placing our bets in areas where we can engage in team-based science to drive innovation forward. So now I'll talk to you a little bit about our moonshot uh, approach to understanding the future of the agri-food system, sustainability, life sciences, and social sciences, and how we're going to use this approach to hopefully help transform uh, the food system of the future. Now, recognizing that a moonshot is, is, is not something, uh, although uh, Mary kind of discussed the idea of going to the moon and a moon rover, and this is a mission to Earth, this is really a way to conceptualize ideas, focusing on innovation, new technologies, actions of solving problems, and bringing disciplines together. Now, with moonshot thinking, we break it down into the idea that we have complex problems that no single domain and no single discipline can address. In fact, you need multiple disciplines coming together across disciplines and with outside partners to engage in the real world solutions. We also know we need innovative thinking that's outside the box, and that can happen naturally when you start bringing groups together around thematic grand challenge areas. And finally, we need to think about new emerging technologies, the good, the bad, the ugly of new technologies that are coming into the market. If we do this, we can then create a mission that goes to, uh, that didn't quite work, but <laughs> that goes to the earth. Now, within our transdisciplinary moonshot initiative, we're focused on five core areas. One, redesigning the 21st century agri-food system for people and planet, one that leaves no one behind and considers sustainability in every aspect of the way in which we grow food and develop supply chains to continue to produce into the future. Two, pioneering life science breakthroughs, recognizing that fundamental breakthroughs like those of Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel, the first woman to win the Nobel uh, who was engaged in understanding genomics uh, uh, in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and was the first woman to win the Nobel in uh, medicine and physiology in the 1980s, that those breakthroughs also are critical. So we need to always think about the basic research, the research that maybe doesn't have a specific goal in mind that's going to happen uh, and affect the world today or maybe even 20 years, but could give rise to a fundamental breakthrough. Third, leading in synthetic biology. So I mentioned synthetic biology with respect to food and getting metals, but we know that it's critical to breeding the crops of the future. We have scientists in the college who are figuring out ways uh, to manipulate the photosynthetic machinery so that it's more effective in a high CO2 world. 
that can drive incredible gains in productivity and spare land and help preserve and conserve the planet into the future. Uh, fourth, accelerating holistic climate solutions. Climate change is really the challenge of our time. It's hard to wrap our minds around global greenhouse gases and the way in which they are imparting extreme conditions around the world, harming people, harming our food system, and giving rise to, to, to sea level change, uh, ice cap uh, instabilities, so on and so forth. We know we have to think very uh, deeply and we have to be thoughtful about how we're going to engage in active solutions to climate. And then finally, we left a strategic wild card. So this was an area that was undefined that we asked our faculty to come together one more time and think of some incredible ideas that we should be focusing on in the college. With this approach, we then launched a new hiring strategy, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it involves a transdisciplinary moonshot initiative where we ask for bottom-up proposals from our faculty to identify cohorts of faculty that we could hire and bring new expertise into the college. We asked our experts to identify a research agenda that was visionary, that was bold, that could have incredible breakthrough potential. We asked them to span both the natural and social sciences so that we're making sure we're understanding human behavior, economics, while we're examining new technologies and innovations that are happening in the lab and in the field. And we wanted to ensure that all of our solutions could be equitable and inclusive and create a sense of community and belonging, again, with our commitment to leaving no one behind in this future food system. And then finally, we asked for academic and uh, non-academic staff hiring, linkages to our extension system, to Cornell Cooperative Extension, so that we can make sure we were translating our knowledge. With this approach, this past year, we received 36 proposals from faculty teams, and we were able to identify 28 new faculty that we'll be hiring over the next three years in the college. These areas include revolutionizing controlled environment agriculture for the 21st century. Recognizing that it's still not profitable to grow food indoors, there needs, it needs a lot of innovation. Some of those innovations are going to come through crop breeding, breeding crops that are capable, that do better in indoor conditions as opposed to outdoors, or dealing with pathogens that can come through controlled environment systems. The supply chain of controlled environment systems that are sustainable and connected to renewable power. Second, we're going to focus on climate resilience and adaptation from cow burps, the methane that's coming out, how to reduce that methane by feeding them uh, different additives, and even work in the ruminant microbiome to see if we can use synthetic biology to transform the microbiome of the cow so that it produces high quality milk in a, in a healthy way that doesn't produce methane. This is a major challenge facing the world. Innovations in crops, breeding crops that are resilient to extreme conditions, whether it's droughts, heat waves, or, um, or other conditions. Green buildings and sustainable landscapes and uh, understanding how we can create sustainable landscapes under extreme conditions. A third area is synthetic biology. We're going to be hiring several new faculty in energy systems, food system technology, and uh, agriculture to grow our base and foundation in our understanding of synthetic biology. Fourth, biodiversity, recognizing that we are undergoing a biodiversity crisis on the planet. We need experts who are thinking about conservation approaches, who are understanding the genomics of these uh, diverse systems and what that means. And so we're gonna be making some considerable investments there. And then finally, a cohort that's focused on ensuring that the energy transition, the food system transformation, the environmental systems are just and equitable as we move forward. So these are five core areas that our new Moonshot Initiative will focus on, which link back strongly to areas like digital agriculture, lab-based technologies, synthetic biology, and controlled environment ag, while we think about how to create a world where we have healthy people and a healthy planet. 
Finally, we're also going to be focusing on turning our knowledge into practice. Now, I mentioned the idea of translating knowledge through our extension network, which is going to be a big part of what we do. We're going to be launching a global extension team that not only is focused on New York State, but is focused on the 61 countries around the world that we're working in right now to make sure that we are uh, taking whatever we're learning here in New York and bringing it to the broader world and taking insights from the broader world back home. We also want to reimagine how research and extension come together through stakeholder engagement activities to take on the most urgent challenges so we can attract the right kind of funding. Many funding agencies now are moving into the realm of translation. The National Science Foundation, for example, has launched an entire new program called The Engines, in which Cornell was, uh, was granted a first round uh, proposal, successful proposal in. But that is where the world is going. So we want to make sure that we're thinking deeply about how we translate our knowledge to generate the funding to support the research. We're also thinking about ways in which we can build commercial, commercial discovery engines. These are ways in which innovations, intellectual property, can work with outside corporations as they take on and advance their businesses and the way in which our own faculty, staff, and students can launch startups. And then finally, we want to make sure that we are continuing to prioritize the, diverse, the needs of our diverse stakeholders through public-private partnerships and uh, making sure that our results are always outside uh, focused. So I'll close here with just a quick case study of some recent ways in which this strategy and this approach are starting to uh, realize benefits. So some of you may have heard of the Bezos Earth Fund. Jeff Bezos uh, committed $10 billion, which is the largest amount of philanthropy ever been committed to solving the climate challenge. And the first round of proposals happened about a year ago. And just this past year, we were very fortunate to be the first agriculturally based uh, college in the United States to receive funding from the Bezos Earth Fund. The new grant will focus on the livestock sector. So I mentioned that livestock is a big source of greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also incredibly important to the livelihoods of so many subsistence farmers around the world. In fact, while 40% of Earth's ice-free land is used to support livestock, uh, it contributes about 40 to 50% of gross domestic product. And in some cases, it's 80% or more of the economic well-being of developing economies, especially in the global south. And yet there's a big problem here when you want to focus on sustainability, protect, protect biodiversity, restore soils, when you have to manage 40% of Earth's land surface. Fencing is just a no-go. It's too expensive. Well, the project that was funded at about $10 billion by the Bezos Earth Fund is focused on virtual fencing. So here, rather than building fences for one-seventh of the price, you can use remote sensing, AI, and collars around the cattle, and you can have them graze, but you can manipulate their movement by using little beeps by their ear with these collars. You can set the parameters on this using satellites and telemetry, and you can take the data, bring it back, and continue to optimize to make sure that as the cows graze, they're getting the right amount, but they're not overgrazing to put the ecosystems under stress. And in condition, as the conditions change on the planet, as you go through weather extremes, you can have them migrate to areas where there is more biomass available so you can continue to help support subsistence farmers around the world. So this grant is going to be working with farmers, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, on putting these collars around their cattle, taking data, taking telemetry systems, and taking uh, GPS uh, remote sensing, and using that to see if we can drive forward uh, virtual fencing. The benefits can be amazing, not only for their economic well-being, for their livelihoods, but for the environment and soil carbon. And that's the optimization that we're trying to work on. So with that, I'll close by thanking you for your time tonight. Thanks for coming out during this uh, incredible weather event we had. And I'm open to any questions you may have. Thank you.